Welcome to the session on Black Men Overcoming Prostate Cancer Disparities Through Screening, Prevention, and Genetics, sponsored by Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered. I'm Vabren Watts, a health science writer for FORCE. In my 15 years of science writing, I've never written about cancer until I joined the team of FORCE a little over a year ago. Through my coverage with the x-ray articles, I have learned a lot about multiple forms of cancer and their likelihood to be inherited. I was shocked actually by my risk for prostate cancer as a black man, which is what led us to this session today. Did you know that we as black men are 50% more likely to develop prostate cancer in, in our lifetime and twice as likely to die from the disease than our white counterparts? Given the higher risk of developing prostate cancer and dying from the disease, black men are more likely to be saved by screening. Screening guidelines have been based on studies that include very few black men, so they may underestimate screening benefits um, of this group. This also leads to the notion that despite the, despite the increased risk of developing prostate cancer and dying from it, black men are underrepresented in clinical trials that test new therapies for prostate cancer, making up only 6.7% of patients. The biggest barrier seems to be the lack of awareness both of the trials themselves and the possible benefits that they offer. Today, we are joined by two people, Dr. David L. Beckley, President Emeritus of Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi, and a prostate cancer survivor, as well as Dr. Kirtland DeVille, Medical Director at Johns Hopkins Protons Therapy Center and Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology and Molecular Radiation Sciences. So, so we will um, lead this session real, pretty much just talking about the experience of, um, of, of, of prostate cancer with our survivor, as well as get some expert information um, from um, Dr. DeVille, which we will call uh, Kurt. So actually, I would like to start out with our uh, survivor, um, which is, uh, as I said, Dr. David, uh, Dr. David Beckley, President Emeritus of Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Uh, so, David, so when were you diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer? Well, let me just kind of give it my, my prostate history, if you would. <laughs> let me start it that way. <laughs> uh, during my tenure as president of Wilder College in Marshall, Texas, I ran into a couple of people who had prostate cancer. And talking with the local physician, he suggested that any black male 40 and above should have an annual PSA. And since I was not 40 or above at that point, I kind of just followed the notion. But uh, at 43, I insisted that my annual physical include a PSA. And initially, the PSA was, well, there was, the doctor can probably clear this up. There was two way of listing PSA rates, zero point something, and then the whole number. And so uh, as I started the prostate, I had the 0 0.01 and 2 and 3. And uh, over the and it, it, it was 42 when I started and 56, my, my rate went to whole, a whole number, which is that time one, I think it was. And I was advised by my local G uh, practitioner, uh, medical doctor, that if it go beyond five, you need to do something about it. So as I, as I walked through the process and, about, and from, from 45 to 56, my number went to three. And at that point, I decided that I need to look at some possibilities because I did not, I was told to go to five, then there's a possible possibility that the prostate uh, could be penetrated with the uh, uh, problem and be attached somewhere in the body. And you begin to look at some type of a treatment. And we talked about three different treatments. We talked about the radical, what they used to call the radical surgery. Doctor, I hope I, if I miss, misquote me, please correct me, what they call radical surgery. Then there was a nerve sparing surgery process and then it was a seed process and so I began to explore all of those different uh, procedures and uh, my general practitioner and instant had uh, who moved to Mississippi from Florida had prostate cancer 13 years before I got involved with trying to decide what to do and he had the seeds implants and the seeds implants had had, had had failed him and he was trying to find a surgeon to take take out his prostate had a hard time doing it we finally found one in Memphis to do that and that's when we started exploring possibilities. And he told me I could, I could let it, I could watch it for a couple more years, or I could begin some type of treatment. And I, I figured if I'm at three, I don't want to take another chance. So I want to take it out. And then I began to look at the, proce the processes, the procedures. The two procedures that I nailed it down to was the radical surgery, which was told that could, could cause other problems in the body. 
you know, after the surgery was not done properly. And then there was a nerve sparing one that some fellow in New York had created some years ago, had pretty well perfected. There was a Memphis, person in Memphis who had been practicing that. So I went to see him. And innocent enough, it was a fellow from South Africa uh, who had, was practicing in Memphis. And so we agreed to do the surgery and uh, we did it. And so far things are working out okay. So you said, so, so, I'm, so I'm gonna back up with, with a couple of things that you said. You said PSA tests. And I want uh, Kurt to um, chime in um, to tell us for, you know, us who are watching, what is a P PSA test? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks again for the invitation. You know, I'm really happy to be part of the panel and the discussion and always excited to, or it's not excited, but eager to, <laughs> to speak on this topic and really reach, you know, men who are particularly at risk in our communities uh, for prostate cancer, because many don't know those statistics that you mentioned in the very beginning. Um, and to Dr. Beckley, David, it's wonderful. I always encourage patients, you know, when they're willing to tell their testimony to sort of speak their story. I, as a physician, you know, sometimes I can talk, you know, for days on end regarding prostate cancer, but to hear it sometimes directly from the patient or the individual who has been through the process can be so much more powerful to the individual that's going through it as well. So I always uh, appreciate and thank um, folks for sharing their testimony. But yeah, you went through a lot. So definitely some pieces we should break down there. The PSA test, kind of most importantly, step one, when we think about um, screening for prostate cancer, meaning and screening, you know, means taking someone who seems normal, healthy, um, but applying a test to see whether they actually have a disease or are at risk for a disease. And in this case, we're talking about cancer and prostate cancer specifically. And for prostate cancer, we're fortunate to have a blood test. There's a lot of controversy and sometimes the PSA blood test gets a, a bad rap, but I always tell men, you know, we are fortunate to have a simple blood test that can send us a signal, give us a, um, it's a marker, can um, send us a sign if there's a concern. And so PSA is prostate specific antigen. Basically, I tell patients it's a protein on a cell on a prostate cell. So it basically is just something that we can use to, as a, um, to estimate how much prostate tissue there is in the body. And so we start to get concerned if we see that number increasing over time and it's getting too high over a certain threshold, there's sort of this somewhat arbitrary line where we say, okay, we think there's enough risk that it's worth going in and now doing an invasive procedure, what we call a biopsy, to sample the prostate, to collect some cells, to see if there's actually cancer within the gland. Um, but because it is a marker and a little bit arbitrary, certainly there are men who have um, and the number we use that cutoff is four. You mentioned that number five is kind of the signal. So somewhere around that range, sort of four is this number that we've defined that there's enough risk to go in and do the biopsy. But certainly there are men who have PSAs that are lower in value and can have aggressive cancer within their prostate. And there are men that can have PSAs above a four that may have no cancer or just very unaggressive or we say indolent prostate cancer. And so the PSA is, I would say, it's not the be all end all. It's just kind of a step one and how we interpret it and use it is what really matters. And, and more than just that that sort of, I keep saying arbitrary because I, I try to drive that home, that, that point home to people. It's not that the PSA is wrong. It's just, we have to use it in the right context. So four is somewhat arbitrary. We also want to look at other parameters like you went through. We want to look at the velocity and the doubling time. How quickly is that PSA increasing over time? If it's a very slow trend upward, then we won't get worried as we check it year to year. But if we start to see certain things like it increased in two points in a single year, so you checked it one year, it was uh, two, and then the next year went to four, even one, and it went to 3.5, well, we're going to get, that's a big jump in one year, we're, we should be advising testing. And very often I hear men say, well, you know, I was told it wasn't quite at a four or a five yet, but you could see in the trend that it was either increasing very quickly or it took a big jump in a year that should have sparked, you know, more attention than, than it got. So, so, so based on, uh, I, I think about Dave's experience, it seemed like he was pretty much on it at a, at a, at a young age about it. I will say I'm 41 and have not had a prostate. Get it, get it, get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I guess the, the first step is for someone, um, I would say like me, like, what is the first step of like getting the prostate? Exactly. Yeah. Let's even go a step back, back backwards. So, you know, how, when do we begin screening or thinking about screening? And there's been a lot of controversy over time that, you know, we don't necessarily have to rehash the details, but there, there's sort of a need to clarify because, you know, much with many things in life is sort of the data changes, you get, you know, one recommendation is made and then it's changed back. 
Um, and so the current guidelines recommend uh, what we call a shared decision-making approach. So it's a conversation between the primary care doctor, a urologist with the patient um, around the risk and benefit of screening. Should we test for prostate cancer? Should we take that PSA test? Um, and the time that when that occurs, the, the main number that's thrown out is usually at age 50. By age 50, you should consider screening. But if you're in a high risk group, you should do it much earlier. And so black men, uh, men of African descent, by definition, are in a high risk category, period, because of those numbers you talked about before. We have a higher rate incidence of getting prostate cancer, and then the death rate is much higher. You know, probably, as we can talk about, it has to do a lot with, you know, access to care. Are we getting appropriate care? Are we getting timely care? Because um, when we do get appropriate, timely, and comparable care, we do just as well as our white counterparts. But nonetheless, um, so we have to start our screening uh, sooner. And so that's at age 45 rather than age 50. Um, but the, and the other high risk categories are men that have had um, uh, multiple, what we call, uh, sorry, have a single first degree relative. So if it runs in your family, you have a family history. And by first degree relative, we mean specifically a father, I say father, brother, or son. If one person has it, the other is much more likely to also get prostate cancer. So uh, father, brother, son. And then if you have multiple first degree relatives, um, so multiple brothers or, you know, um, that sort of thing, then it's actually even at age 40, you could begin screening. So a black man with multiple family members at age 40. And many, many societies like the American Neurologic Association will advocate for starting that early screening anyway at age 40. You could establish a baseline PSA, and then you can follow it over time. If it's very low, they may not even need to check it every year. They might do every two years, for example, if it's a below a two. Um, and so the urologist, you know, they, and that's why we call that, we talk about that shared decision-making approach. They should be kind of counseling you or the primary care doctor walking through these options um, of the screening, you know, assessing well your history and sort of knowing how early do we need to start on that screening pathway. Um, and the, you know, the other thing I'll add is very often, you know, by the time I see men, they're, you know, they're diagnosed, we need to come up with a treatment plan. And I'll ask them, you know, was the PSA being monitored? Were you being screened for prostate cancer? And they very often will say, well, I don't know, I thought I was. And so I say, you know, if you thought you were, you weren't being appropriately screened. If you don't know the answer to that and can say definitively yes or no, then you weren't appropriately being screened because you should be having a conversation. Even if they're checking that PSA blood test uh, and you see it kind of on the list of labs that are drawn, there really should be a conversation about assessing your, your family history for prostate cancer and other cancers, frankly, but prostate cancer, since we're talking about that today. Um, and then, so knowing the family history, and then again, your genetic ancestry, you know, being of African descent for Black men, we have a higher rate in this country. So it's really important that we should be having those conversations with our primary care doctors. So, I, so I, agree. You know, oh, I, I, I agree with that, what was said by the doctor. The thing is that I, my, we have an uncle who had prostate cancer because he had his prostate, his, he was diagnosed after I had my, my surgery. And that's the only known case in the family that I'm aware of with it. But uh, as I said, I was in Texas when I started talking with fellows about the prostate process. And I was all the information you just shared about is it's, 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 no, it's heavy in the black community because black males have certain priorities that we want to do and not want to go damage certain areas, as they call it. <laughs> but but at, and I tell the tell fellows, you know, you got a choice. Either you, you, you monitor it, or you ignore it, or you become fertilizer for a tree. And that may sound cruel, but that's exactly what, what will happen. And we're losing too many black men because they refuse to go and have the test. And then when they find the test, they try to delay the surgery part until it's too late. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, that stigma, basically. There's sort of a yeah. stigma around, yeah. you know, talking about the prostate. What is the prostate? What does the prostate do? You know, where it sits in our body, the function that it provides to men. Um, and so, you know, often people just don't want to talk about it um, yeah. at all, really. And very often I'll tell them, you know, the, and you, what you described, the minute they say they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer and they start to talk to other people, they realize how many other people they know actually have prostate cancer, went right. through these experiences and just had not shared that. Even family, friends, the sort of broader network. And we know from the numbers that you quoted that that is the case, but it's just not the conversations that are happening. So really important why we're having this conversation today. The other thing about it, that once you, once you, open up your mind and share with other people, you'd be surprised to know what people in your community already had it. 
-hmm. there's a fraternity of men out there and they're mm -hmm. looking to talk to people about their experiences, make suggestions, recommendations. I get calls from all, of, all across my fraternity brothers. I understand you have prostate cancer. I've been tested. What do I need to do? Go get the test and monitor it. And they get well, let us say, get above a whole number of three to four, you need to do something about it. And I did when 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 we when I went in uh, at at the three, they did do the biopsy and they found two spots. I said we need to get them out. And so let's decide which way to get them out. And that's what we did. And I've had uh, that was been 21 years ago now. And I still my numbers are still 0 0.1. The funny thing about when they changed the, the scale, the scale rating from the whole numbers to the you know the zero point something was zero point and I said what is it what does that mean <laughs> he said, don't worry so you okay you're okay but the business has been, been that way for the last uh 20 20 20, 20 plus years now but I get I still I get the test twice a year one from VA and one from a medical doctor and have them check each on each other to make sure we're in the same range that way not. one of the things uh that that I, that I heard um you say that, that, that we talked about, so I want to go back to, um, we were talking about our, uh, family history of, um, of like prostate cancer or other cancers, because we do know that some, sometimes you may have, um, prostate cancer may be linked to other hereditary cancers. And so, um, and so David, did they um, ask you about your family history for cancer? You know, Yeah, my, my mother had, had uh, breast cancer and she died uh, with breast cancer, uh, before I had uh, my diagnosis of having a, a PSA situation. Uh, and I think that's the only one that I'm aware of with, uh, with, with, a, with a cancer type de death close to, close to me, my mother. Now we had a cousin, you know, Eddie died with cancer also, uh, uh, but no, I don't think he had prostate cancer. I'm not, I'm not aware of it in a way. And 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 um, did you um, undergo? Did they offer? Uh, I guess undergo any type of genetic testing just to see if it no, was no, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't I'd say. I you need to just tell me if, if I have have a, have a, with my PSA scores in the danger zone, and then we go from that point. We didn't go to the go to the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, so 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 uh, so uh, Kurt, um, I, I will ask. You know, in some cases, you know, that, that it, it is you know a, a hereditary thing with prostate cancer. How, how important is genetic testing? Yeah, yeah, and you know, I think it's important to acknowledge our our understanding of of genetics, you know, um, and prostate cancer specifically, you know, has evolved, and and particularly in the most recent years, even our understanding is increasing. I think it's the era that we're entering as we hear about sort of personalized medicine. It's really understanding the genes of the tumor, the genes of the patient. And what are they at risk for um, developing? And those can help to predict response, appropriate treatments, response to treatment. That's really the area we're entering and, and really sort of maximizing um, our knowledge in that. Um, but and so for uh, currently, you know, anytime if you're suspicious about if, if you have a strong family history of multiple cancers, that should trigger, you know, right away to consider some genetic testing. Um, and it's particularly uh, cancers at younger ages, especially in particular. So that's, you know, not, not um, your, your case in particular, um, Dr. Beckley, but um, in up for other patients, you know, if you do have multiple family members, it should spark the clinician, you know, the physician, and usually at this point, it would be the oncologist, whoever's sort of managing the cancer treatment uh, to think about that. And very often we'll refer to a medical geneticist specifically um, who can run these tests. Um, but in terms of prostate cancer guidelines, so anyone who is diagnosed with, um, uh, well, actually, sorry, let me just say one thing. So most commonly, most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer, the most common scenario is that they say they didn't have any family history. It is the most common cancer mm -hmm. in men. So at the end of the day, it's still the most common scenario that they say they don't know, you know, they didn't have a family history, they don't know. Um, but there are certain um, links to family history, and there are some certain inherited um, specific types of prostate cancer that can run in families. Um, certain genes, what we call cancer genes, can be linked to prostate cancer, and like for the breast cancer gene, for example, can manifest in men as prostate cancer. Um, and so the, the national guidelines, if we look at, for example, the NCCN, the National um, Cancer Comprehensive Network, which I call sort of the national guidelines, and those are free and available to people online NCC, at nccn.org. 
Um, they talk up, they recently added um, genetic testing for any man who any man who's diagnosed with aggressive prostate cancer that, you know, at the time of the diagnosis has either spread beyond the prostate, so what we call metastatic prostate cancer, or if it's not spread, but they have aggressive features, um, such as a high Gleason score. So when we do the biopsy and we sample the prostate, it's assigned a score that we call the Gleason score. Right. Um, and so anyone with a high risk score um, should also um, undergo genetic testing. Um, and so that's assessing, and these are, this is pretty easy and straightforward these days. There's a variety of commercially available kits um, that you, you know, you just spit in a tube or they do a swab and it gets sent off. And um, it's testing for specific uh, cancer genes um, or mutations, abnormalities, um, and some of which you know we know are gene cancer genes that we know, and they're associated with certain cancers. Um, and and sometimes there may be some abnormalities that are just noted. And sometimes I tell the patient, it's we just don't know what those mean yet. And over time, as our understanding improves, we may start to understand better. You know, does that lead to other types of cancer or predict for response to other types of treatment? Um, so that genetic uh, testing should be done for all men uh, with aggressive prostate cancer. Go back to the Gleason score. My Gleason score was, was, was low, lower than five. But I, did, I, I, I guess that grew up with the uh, PSA score. That's what I look at. How do you explain that? Mm -hmm. is this is, so, it, is it an explanation <laughs> I, no no absolutely and so that's why you know i sort of tell people it's they're kind of data points right and so we're bringing in all of the information it's like the detective right he doesn't go by one piece of evidence that you need all yeah. that evidence to pull together the story and and the story we're pulling together is what is this this patient in front of us um what is their prostate cancer telling us how aggressive is it where is it located what do we need to do to treat it and so nationally, what we do, and this is described in the NCC and in the, in the guidelines, actually nationally, now internationally, what's developed for prostate cancer is called the risk group stratification. And that incorporates the PSA, the marker in the blood, the Gleason score, which is the marker from the tissue, um, and then what we call the stage, the tumor stage. And that is where do we see signs of cancer if we do imaging like an MRI or a CAT scan or a bone scan? Um, or um, did we feel anything, which we haven't talked about, but that digital rectal exam, the sort of finger test where you're in to have a physical exam, the physician, you know, palpates the prostate, um, and if they feel a nodule or an abnormality. So we, we stay what we call stage the prostate cancer based on those findings, the digital or imaging. And then we take those variables, the PSA, the blood test, and the tumor stage, and we assign a risk group. And that risk group, um, really the definition is what is the risk of that cancer recurring or coming back after the initial treatment? Is it a high risk? Is it an intermediate risk or is it a low risk? But it, in some ways it's kind of, I tell patients, the aggressiveness of the cancer is a, you know, high, medium, sort of low. Um, and then that helps us define appropriate treatments. So in your case, it sounds like the cancer was picked up early, which is what we want. It's a good thing. And so it was probably classified in that low risk box in that early or what we would just call an early stage prostate cancer. And so then the treatment options at that point are either to do observation, which we used to call watchful waiting, but we know that's not a good term anymore. It's called surveillance or active surveillance, meaning we're going to closely keep an eye on that cancer with PSA blood tests and an occasional MRI or biopsy so that when we see it becoming more aggressive, then we're going to jump in with treatment. But that helps us avoid over-treatment, right, of unnecessary cancer that is unaggressive and, and sometimes we can defer or delay treatment for patients. Um, but the alternative is if we don't do that surveillance and we do treatment, that's where we're deciding between the surgery and the radiation as you were talking through before and deciding, navigating through those options. Um, go, go back to keep keep let me ask a question about chemo the one of the reasons why i decided to do the the what they call nerve sparing surgery is that i was told that once they perform the surgery they could do all the testing to determine whether there's a need for any chemo while before they completed the, the process i guess close your body whatever you have whatever you call it that way and there was no need for chemo in my case or any other type of uh, uh, treatment for, for, for the cancer because it's confined to the prostate gland, I was told, and the yeah. nerve endings did not test anything positive at that point. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because fellow may hear that also, it may have a different idea about the surgery or whatnot. Yeah, just to walk through that briefly, I'll try not to take, oh, yeah. it, take it too long. I mean, because <laughs> this is when we have the consultation with the patient, we're sort of walking through, and it's usually a 60 to 90 minute conversation because yeah. mm -hmm. there's a lot of things we got to go through. 
Um, but when, so I tell people, you can take the surgery road or you can take the radiation road. And that the, um, the best available evidence tells us that those treatments are equally effective to eliminate the cancer. And that's why they're presented to you both upfront as comparable options. But they're obviously very different in terms of the logistics, the nuances, some of those details that you're talking about. Um, but um, chemotherapy for prostate, like chemotherapy very often refers to um, a very specific like chemical therapy. If we think about the category of like systemic treatments or treatments that go into the whole body, what you're likely talking about is what is often called hormone therapy, hormonal therapy. Um, and prostate cancer responds to um, hormone manipulation. And essentially we're not giving hormones, we're taking away the body's ability to make testosterone when we give hormones. So it's more of an anti-hormone. And the technical term is called androgen suppression or androgen deprivation, because we're taking away the male androgen hormone testosterone, usually temporarily from the body. Um, so if you take surgery, one, if, if you do the surgery pathway, you know, they remove the prostate, they're going to analyze the specimen, they're going to look under the microscope, they're going to say, was the cancer penetrating through the prostate? Was it um, through the shell, what we call the capsule? Was it in the tiny gland sitting on top called the seminal vesicles? Was it at the margin, the edges of the specimen? Or was it any lymph nodes? They'll sample some regional and the lymph nodes are, you know, sometimes cancer likes to escape and get, um, use the lymph node system to escape the body. It doesn't do it as commonly for prostate cancer like it does for some other cancers like breast and lung cancer, but it can still happen. Happen. So it sounds like what you were talking about, about right there was they were talking about that analysis that they do afterwards, because if you see some of those concerning features, like if it had made it to the lymph nodes, very often we talk about needing hormonal therapy or that, that androgen suppression, um, because we, need, we know the cancer escaped. And so we need a treatment that can act systemically through the body to catch any of those cells that had escaped the prostate. Um, just to mention, there is this other scenario where, so if the patient takes the radiation pathways, they, they don't have surgery and we're going to do radiation treatments, which as you described, can be with seed implants or we're implanting radioactive seeds into the, into the prostate that's done under anesthesia. So it's, it's not like surgery, but it is done in an operating room under anesthesia, You're just sticking needles instead of making an incision um, directly through the skin. Um, and implanting radioactive seeds. The alternative radiation method is to just do what we call external beam radiation. So you're delivering external radiation targeted at the prostate and the patient usually comes in for a few weeks, you know, every day, Monday through Friday for a few weeks, four weeks, five weeks, uh, it used to be eight weeks, but now we can do it in, in shorter amounts of time. But if, if men have aggressive features to their cancer, so I was talking about that risk group stratification. So if they have a high risk cancer, or an intermediate risk cancer, or a high Gleason score, eight to 10, a PSA test that's very high, 15 or above, when we do radiation, the studies have shown the radiation is more effective. You get a higher cure rate, a better survival. When you add in temporary suppression of the testosterone. So you add in some hormonal therapy. Um, and so sometimes patients, yeah, they ask me, I heard I need chemo. I know I heard I need hormones with my radiation treatment. Or I had a friend that had this hormonal therapy. That's, that's often the scenario that they're talking about. The other last scenario where hormones plays the primary role is if when the prostate cancer has spread, you know, throughout the body or they've the cancer has come back after these other treatments. They've had surgery, radiation, and now it's come back. Usually that means it's, it's disseminated, it's spread somewhere in the body that we see it or we don't see it, but you need something to act on the whole body. And that's gonna be the hormonal therapy. So, so it sounds like that um, we, we have like two minutes remaining. So, so, so you, know, you know, from this, we were able to um, have this conversation and really talk about you know, um, a uh, survivor's experience with like uh, being diagnosed with going through treatment. And the thing is that 21 years later, as you said, David, you know, he is here today to share his story and, and his experience. So David, I would like to ask you um, in this closing um, last question, what advice would you give another black man who may be hesitant about prostate cancer screening? Because it seems like, as I said at the beginning, that screening definitely helps can can help reduce um, reduce death um, 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 from this um, disease. Any well, any man period, but particularly African American man at forty and above, again get the PSA test. Ask your doctor about it, 
uh, you'll be surprised at this that the men you will come in contact with once you go through this process as a fraternity out there and when they hear that you you've had you're going through the process they come to you and talk about to reassure that you'll be okay but the main thing is to get the test and follow the direction of your doctor so so please fellas uh, if you want to continue to live and when you turn 40 add that to your annual physical psa check all right and and Dr. Uh, Deville, Kurt, I do have. I, I, I know I said one last question, but I do have one one question for you. Is just if you can just summarize in a nutshell, what can we do to present to prevent this cancer from spreading? You know, among our uh, community and our fraternity of guys, a, a fraternity of black men. I put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Building on Dr. Beckley's comment, you know, it's get get screened and get tested, and don't you know avoid ignore. Um, you know, I think we need to really be advocates for ourselves, for our family members, for our communities. You know, this is a new era in medicine that, you know, used to be very paternalistic. You just do what the doctor says. And, you know, I think now we need to understand that um, this is not that, that time. You know, we need to advocate for ourselves. And if anything, we harm ourselves when we don't. So if you don't go to the doctor, it, you're the only one that's missing out, that's losing out and you lose that opportunity to have the best outcome. Cancer is always, um, our outcomes are always better. Our survival, our ability to cure, eliminate cancer are always better when we are tested early and pick, and pick it up early. And, and a, a common thing I hear often is, is men will say, why well, I'm not feeling anything. I don't have any symptoms. And usually I say, if we've waited for symptoms from cancer, we have waited too long. Your mm -hmm. outcomes are always worse. We always want to stay ahead of the cancer, not trying to be catching up to the cancer. Um, and so, you know, get get a physical seat, you know, do your routine primary care, because that's where it all starts. We put so much effort into our, our you know, our, our cars, our vehicles, our work, you know, every other thing that we do, but we don't do that for our own bodies very often. And actually our family members, our spouses, wives, cousins, friends, you know, they're the ones who are sort of telling us like, hey, you know, have you checked yourself out? And so we, you know, really we need to take that onus on ourselves and and find a you know a good a good doctor have a good relationship with your physician um you know some of my family members will tell me well, i didn't tell my doctor that or they don't and i'll say you know if you if you can't talk to your doctor then you need to find a new doctor you need to find somebody because you, again you are only harming yourself by not giving them that information i want to know i'll ask the patient you know so of all that we talk about, what sounds reasonable? What, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to implement? Because we can work with that, right? It doesn't have to be an all or none. And for prostate cancer specifically, I'll, I'll wrap it up on this note. You know, I hear a lot about, again, the stigma of the digital rectal exam. Everybody's worried. I got to go have a physical. And that keeps people away from getting the physical. And then they're not even getting the cardiovascular health check, their blood pressure, all the other things that they need. Um, you know, if that does, don't let that be the barrier to you getting screened for prostate cancer. So, you know, you can decline if you, you know, are concerned or worried. Um, they can still do the PSA blood test and interpret it again, knowing that you didn't also do a digital exam with it. But don't uh, just not go to the doctor because you're so worried or afraid of that. You know, again, this is your health. You can talk to and have a negotiation with the doctor about, okay, what you're willing to do. And maybe over time, things will change or change your mind or what something will happen. But again, don't make it an all or none and miss out on the opportunity to, to save your health, to have your best health outcome. Amen. Well, well stated. <laughs> and 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 to quote you at the end, if you're waiting on symptoms, you have definitely waited too long. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining um, Overcoming Prostate Cancer Disparities Through Screening Prevention and Genetics. If you want to find out more information about prostate cancer and or prostate cancer in Black men, please visit the Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered website. Thank you once again, gentlemen, for joining us and let's continue this conversation. <laughs>